Good morning, everyone. My name is Danielle McNichol, and I'm with Newman University's Center for Leadership. Today, we'll be discussing social media for small businesses and nonprofits. Uh, we have the privilege of having three fantastic speakers here today, um, including our partners from Bellevue Communications and Caratech E2 Today. Um, but before we get to that, a few quick housekeeping items. Um, our, our webinars upon completion, you'll be receiving um, an, a link to any information that was provided. If you have any further questions or would like to visit the website, it's located at www.nucenter4leadership.com. Uh, please note that every Tuesday and Friday at 10 a.m. we do have similar webinars. Uh, feel free to sign up for those free webinars as well. Um, we also, you'll be receiving a certificate upon completion of the webinar. Um, and also a link to a questionnaire to tell us how we might be able to do this better. Um, I would also tell you to please check out our Open and Delco website that has similar um, digital series items, including how to participate in different types of webinars, um, how to uh, do some basic connection items that I think are very important, particularly for small businesses and not-for-profits that are kind of jumping into some of these areas. Um, at this point in time, uh, again, as I mentioned, we have Nancy Karamanico with Digital Technology Specialist at Caratech at E2K, London Faust, Digital Media Manager from Bellevue Communications, and Alex Dyer, the Director of Digital Media. Alex? Hi, everyone. Thanks, Danny. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, we are Really excited to uh, you know be here and hopefully provide you with some useful tips and uh, you know some guidance in terms of how you're approaching your uh, social media strategy and content creation now that we are all kind of working remotely and adjusting to what is a sort of new normal in uh, the professional world. So um, quickly. I will uh, give a quick round of introductions uh, for our panelists. Again, my name is Alex Steyer. I am the Director of Digital Media at Bellevue Communications Group. Uh, we're a full service public relations, uh, digital strategy, and strategic mess messaging firm. Uh, we're located in Philadelphia. Uh, I've been there about seven years, and in my role as Director of Digital Media, I try to help clients uh, to bridge the gap between what is traditional media, that's television, print, radio, and digital media, uh, you know, social media, video, and other platforms, uh, and basically using the kind of uh, connected mechanisms between those two worlds to reach audiences in new ways. So um, that's really my role, and um, hopefully, like I said, today we're going to be able to give you a lot of good tips um, for your own strategy and your own business, um, but without any further ado, I uh, want to introduce my colleague, London Faust. Uh, she is the Digital Media Manager at Bellevue. And uh, London, tell the group a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I am lucky enough to work with Alex as part of a digital team at Bellevue that really works to grow you know, our digital marketing, our social media arm. Um, I've been there for five years and have just been so lucky to work on great clients in the city, including Reading Terminal Market. I work with a mainline retirement community. I work with several education nonprofits, some advocacy groups. So it's really across the board. And, you know, I do a little bit of traditional public relations and a little bit of social media. So I really, you know, see how those intertwine. Um, I'm also the president-elect for the Philadelphia Public Relations Association and a Temple grad. Woo, thanks, Lennon. Um, and also, so with us, uh, Nancy Karamanico. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Nancy for the last couple of years, um, both with New University Center for Leadership uh, and some other initiatives. And uh, Nancy, go ahead, uh, tell people a little bit about yourself and uh, who you work with. Hi, my name is Nancy Karamanico, and I am a digital technology specialist. I have the honor of supporting the Newman University Center for Leadership and working with this great team with um, Danny and Alex and Jen here today. And I have worked in the educational technology space for close to 25 years now. Began first supporting schools with their use of technology and worked with all the schools in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, K-12. And when social media came on the scene, it was a wonderful way for schools to stay connected with one another. And um, so I really focus on helping 
organizations and schools to use all kinds of technology, but specifically social media. And I focus a lot on the how-to pieces of it. And um, I was very lucky to be able to work on the team that welcomed Pope Francis to Philadelphia. So it, with that team, we, we got to work on the social media and the website pieces. And that was kind of exciting to see that global reach. So I'm happy to be here today to share with all of you. Wonderful. Thanks, Nancy. Um, and quickly, i uh, going to throw something in the chat and want to encourage all of you to, if you have any questions, um, please post them in the chat. Um, we're going to do our best at the end of the program. Uh, we're going to try and move as quickly as possible and leave about <laughs> five, you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes at the end of the program uh, to answer your questions. So um, on that note, I also want to say thank you to all of those who took time to uh, submit their questions ahead of time um, and uh, fill out our survey that we sent out yesterday. Uh, really helped us to be able to help you and guide our conversation today. Um, I know we had a lot of folks who said they wanted to get some sort of kind of uh, where to start instructions and some ideas on how to come up with and post content. So um, that's where we're going to focus our attention right now. And uh, so that's going to kick off nicely into our first question. And I'm going to post this both to London and Nancy. Uh, this is something that, you know, we've been hearing pretty constantly um, for about the last six weeks or so. And um, so I'll start with London and then I'll uh, post to Nancy as well. But uh, what do you tell small business owners who tell you uh, it's time, we need to jump in, we need to get on the social, and we need to get into social media now? Um, what do you tell them, Linda? Sure. I mean, I think that I see it everywhere. There are so many businesses and just organizations that were not on social media before, or they were not active on social media before, and now they've realized that's really the only way that they can communicate with their audiences. So understanding that it was already a very saturated space and it's gotten more crowded in the light of coronavirus. So just understanding that if you don't have time for it, you shouldn't try to do it because you need to be committed and posting regularly and doing the things you need to do to break through that noise and that crowd of people. And one of the ways that you can do that is if you personally are not on whatever platform it is that you're going to use, you have to get on and create a personal profile and use it because you're never going to be successful in doing social media for a business if you aren't doing it for yourself as a consumer. And with that being said, I don't, you don't have to make a Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok for yourself. Just look at your audience and see where they're at. Meet them there on the platform that you think would best reach them. And then just create that for yourself and kind of explore a little bit notice trends, just understand how other people are using it so that you can effectively use it as a business owner or a social media manager or whatever that may be. Great. That's lovely. Uh, Nancy, do you have anything to add on that front? Um, anything that you've been telling clients particularly? To London's point, many people are gravitating now towards <clears throat> social media. And what I'm hearing from a lot of uh, different clients and organizations is they already have the account set up but it was not their main form of communication with their customers or their members. And now they're finding that they want to really pay attention to that as a main source. So what I would say to that is you, if you have the programs already set up, you can just get in there and, and use those as, as a good communications channel. But it will require some attention to you know, looking at your followers, looking at the kinds of things you post. And, you know, I think you're in good shape if you've already set up your profiles and you just want to increase those at this time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's, uh, you know, really driving home the point there. Uh, if you're not using it yourself, uh, if you're not at the very least finding your competitors, um, logging on, you know, creating a Facebook, a Twitter or whatever, um, and at the very least, looking at your competitors or your similar organizations, um, that's a really great place to start. If you just can look at what other businesses that are similar to you have on their profiles, have in terms of content, um, that's going to be a really great place for you to get some ideas. So um, with that, 
Uh, let's talk a little bit about the platforms, and I, uh, this is something that we do in our typical kind of social media training, um, so I'm going to kick it to London, who is the uh, eloquent one of us, and uh, wanted to tell us, London, uh, give us a quick basic overview of kind of our four major platforms, and then, you know, kind of what are the peripheral ones that are out there as well. Sure. So, I mean, I feel like everybody usually starts with Facebook. It's something that's been around for a while, and I think it is a really good place to start in for a small business for anyone who's really just dipping their toe in social media it has a lot of functionality you could even really use it in place of a web and you don't have the time to go create one you could start with Facebook um, you know you have the ability to write a little bit more you can do photos videos links all that good stuff um, so that's really where I would recommend anybody who's looking to get started is with Facebook um, it also skews a little older. So if your audience is older, um, you know, like 35 and up, it's definitely a really great place to be. Uh, if your audience skews, excuse me, if your audience skews a little younger, Instagram is a good place. Uh, it's very visually driven. So if you have a bank of good photos and videos, obviously it's really tricky for everybody to go out and get content right now because we're all at home. So if you have a pretty good set of existing photos and videos. Instagram would be good. Um, and then Twitter is, it's pretty fast paced. It's where a lot of people go to get their news these days. And it's a good place to kind of go and observe trends that are happening. But I wouldn't necessarily recommend getting on Twitter as just a short term solution or just something that you're doing right starting out, just because I don't know that it's going to be necessarily successful for a small business owner. Um, and then YouTube, if you, again, video, if you have video, YouTube has the capability to go live, uh, but that's pretty much, it's just strictly video. So if you're doing at home DIYs or cooking or things like that, that are really visual, that would be a good place, but otherwise you can kind of stay away from it. Um, and then Snapchat, TikTok, those skew very young. And if you don't have the time and energy to really invest and be super creative, I wouldn't even bother. Very good, very good advice, London. Um, as a uh, 35 year old um, who has dabbled very, very, very limitedly in TikTok, um, I'm gonna say, just leave it alone for those yeah. of you who are my age and older. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so uh, let's take a quick uh, question, or I mean, let's uh, pose another question to Nancy. Um, this one is just in terms of frequency. Um, as London had said, we do want to post regularly. If you're going to commit to it, uh, you definitely want to be posting regularly. So, uh, Nancy, how often uh, do you typically advise clients to post? And has this changed now that uh, you know we're all kind of working from home and in the post-coronavirus world? I think having a very consistent presence is what's important. So whether you're posting three or four times a day to Facebook, or, you know, you don't want to post a lot and then don't post for a week. Like that inconsistency is, is not good for having people understand what it is your organization does. So, so Facebook, you know, one to two times a day. Twitter tends to be more frequent. So might be two to 10 times a day. Instagram, uh, if you're doing Instagram posts, you know, they should be really daily. And if you're doing stories, you can do stories also um, daily. Sometimes it's a little bit less on the weekends. So you'll often see, see people posting a little bit less on the weekends. But what's important is that consistency and the consistency of your messaging. That, that it's, it's always putting out the consistent types of ideas about your mission and what you're trying to do. Uh Thanks, Nancy. London, anything um, in your perspective changing in terms of, um, you know, since coronavirus and, and now that everybody's working at home? Yeah. Um, I mean, like we said, people are just on the internet more. So it's, it's tricky because every platform has an algorithm and nothing shows up chronologically in order anymore. So you really have to, like Nancy said, be consistent and kind of follow the rules of what these platforms have set out in order to get your content shown. Um, so if it seems a little daunting to post every single day, I would recommend maybe creating a schedule of types of content. So, yeah. you know, there's a trend that's hashtag throwback Thursday. So 
if on Thursday you just want to post a photo of something that previously happened for your business, there you go. Thursday's taken care of. And just kind of thinking about, you know, Monday, maybe you post what's going on for the week and just like make it a little bit more accessible for yourself because you're also still running a business. And, you know, we absolutely respect that and know that social media is not the first thing that you want to do when you wake up in the morning, but it's just so crucial right now. So kind of figuring out how you can post with that regularity in a way that makes sense for you. And I, I see a lot of businesses doing that. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's the big takeaway there is, um, you know, it's not necessarily about how much um, or, you know, what the, you know, sort of kind of by the book rules used to say, but consistency is what matters right now. And um, so long as you're committed to, you know, if it's twice a week, great. If it's three times a week, great. If it's twice a day, great. But again, if you're not achieving that level of consistency, you're not going to see the kind of consistent results that you want. Um, okay, really quick, I uh, had two people who pinged us on LinkedIn. So I just want to address that really quickly and um, say that uh, in our experiences, we find that LinkedIn is a really great tool for uh, B2B or business to business marketing, um, particularly if you're in the, uh, you know, kind of sales realm, um, if you're in the, uh, you know, professional services realm, um, definitely it's, a, it's something to consider. And if you don't have a personal LinkedIn page, and you are working, you know, well, heck, if you don't have a personal LinkedIn page, you should absolutely consider creating one. Um, it basically doubles over as an online resume and it's searchable on Google. Um, it's really easily categorized. Everything looks the same. You can get personal recommendations from people. So it is a really great tool for an individual. Say if you're a consultant, if you're trying to grow your own personal business, um, but for the average, uh, you know, retail location, a business to consumer based company, um, LinkedIn's going to be a little bit of a tough nut to crack for you. So um, I typically would say that, uh, you know, definitely if you're in the consulting world, if you're in the business to business sales world, definitely consider LinkedIn. It should be part of your, uh, you know, part of your suite of, of uh, profiles. So anyway, uh, moving right along. Uh, let's talk a little bit about growing a following. Um, that's something that we heard from a couple of folks uh, ahead of time and uh, want to send this to London then. Uh, what kind of strategies have you employed to grow a following organically? And when we say organically, we just mean without paid advertising. Sure. So I think it's all about using the tools that already exist. So if if you haven't already, you should put the little social media icons on your website so that when people go to your website for information and maybe they don't find exactly what they're looking for, they can immediately click from your website to your Facebook page or whatever. And similarly, if you have an email list or a traditional mailing list, just make sure that you are making your customers and your audience aware that your social media platforms exist because they can't find you if they don't know that you're there. So I think that's kind of where you start and also just, you know, make sure that you're posting unique information that they wouldn't be able to get elsewhere. And, you know, they're not going to come to your page and if they're getting, if they're finding information that they already know, they're not going to come back. And I think that engaging with your audience kind of similar to what we did here in asking you all questions, like what you wanted to hear from us beforehand is really valuable. So if you engage with your customers, share their posts, comment on their posts, answer their comments, it's just going to build that loyalty and keep them coming back. Sure. Uh, one thing I want to add to that too, London, which, um, you know, it's always kind of been, uh, it's, it's one of those things that ends up coming kind of like, you, it hits you in the head and you're like, why didn't I think of that? But um, for any business owner, if you, if you're starting from scratch, Start with your friends and family. Um, that's a really, Facebook has a really easy, you know, suggest tool to invite your friends um, to like your page. And it's the best and honestly, um, you know, it's the, it's the best place to start. I mean, I've used it countless times, uh, even in situations where I was like, there's no way any of my friends are ever going to like this page that I'm suggesting to them. And like, voila, you get 20 likes out of it. And then all of a sudden you're kind of moving in a positive direction then because ultimately if you're not willing to start and put a little bit of personal skin in the game, um, you're going to have a really hard time getting yourself off that ground and up into a particular, you know, level where you're getting organic growth. So um, additionally, uh, you know, the use of hashtags and locations, um, particularly as it's relevant to Twitter or 
Instagram more. I would say a little bit on Twitter as well. Um, but definitely, uh, that's something that, again, if you're using it in your personal life and you know what hashtags you want to search out or things that may be relevant to you, um, that might be relevant to your business as well. So it might, you might find your personal life leading into avenues where you can grow your business accounts. So, uh, let's take a quick second to talk about groups as well. This is another really, uh, kind of newer wave way that businesses are using to grow followings and engage with users. Um, I know that um, personally, we've had some very uh, great success with the Open and Delco Facebook group. Uh, Nancy is one of the moderators of that group. And, um, you know, want to really take a quick second to ask Nancy about uh, strategies that you've employed to either a successfully grow a Facebook group following and also <laughs> how to successfully moderate a Facebook group. I think that's a really important one that we're gonna talk about as well. So um, real quick, Nancy, um, just tell us a little bit about uh, you know, how you've used some groups to, to sort of grow and engage with followers. Uh, well, we all saw groups come front and center with the Super Bowl ad this year. Well, the, they showed the people rocking on the porch and all the different yeah. groups and Facebook has spent a lot of time in the last several months really expanding knowledge about what groups can do. And that all happened right before the current situation we're in. Um, with groups, it can you can set up a group very easily. You can set up a group and tie it to your business page, or it can be tied to a personal page. And it's really you just can send it to friends, like Alex mentioned, you send it to friends, you've sent it to businesses, and people can sign up. Right within the Facebook app, you can invite people you are already connected to on Facebook and pages you're already connected to. You can also invite people who are already following your business page. So just by sending out those invitations through Facebook, you can also generate a link right from within the app and then that link can be shared out via email, um, the website, anywhere like that. So really getting uh, people as they're joining to grow the, grow the group and then just continuing along with engagement and information. And Alex is asking about moderating a group. In terms of moderating a group, you can set up some guidelines and rules for a different group for groups people can be asked questions before they're admitted into a group if you wish when you set up your group it will say do you want to set up some questions so you can put those in there um, if you you can also set some guidelines for participation in groups which is important because if you have a certain culture you want to cultivate there or a certain community um, goals that you want to cultivate there, you can include those front and center to people when they, they join the group. So the moderation tool is super simple and anybody who's a moderator of a group will have the ability to add people to approve posts, to delete posts, and to really look at the statistics and, and watch how that group is growing and see what the most popular topics are. I think that's really important, Nancy. Um, and I think that the sort of that idea of cultivating um, and stating clearly and upfront, um, anybody who has been part of a Facebook group or you know has joined one, you typically see before you join, you get a big list of the rules and the regulations, and you have to be you know civil, civil discourse. Um, you know, no spamming, no you know like unnecessary business posts. Um, there's lots and lots of ways that you can set the ground rules ahead of time so that you know if indeed it comes down to it, um, and you got to boot somebody, then you're not booting somebody you know for without warning. You know, you at least are setting up the, the expectation of this is what we want and this is how we want to cultivate it. Um, had a quick question here from somebody asking, how do you distinguish? a Facebook group from a company or business page. And what I would say is you distinguish that because a Facebook group is typically something uh, or a, a sort of amalgamation around an idea, a cause, or a, an interest. Um, and so the example that I would use is, uh, so say a company, a business page would be a bike shop. So I am Alex Steyer, I own Alex's bike shop. And as the business owner, I have my business page. But 
if I wanted to maybe engage with a new group of people, I might look for a Facebook group that is uh, bike trail enthusiasts, uh, outdoor enthusiasts, uh, fans of a specific trail that might be in my neighborhood. Um, I live down in Delaware County, so the Chester Creek Trail is a great app, uh, uh, trail that we use here and has a really engaged Facebook group or Facebook page, but then also you find things in other groups that are affiliated with outdoor recreation in Delaware County. So again, that's really the distinction point there is a business is a business and interest and idea and uh, you know a cause, that's where you can really come into a group setting. And that's where really groups can be very useful. So um, let's see, uh, wanna take a quick, and I, actually real quick, do you have anything to add on the Facebook group side just so we can kind of close that out? No, I mean, I think you both covered it very Fantastic. well. Um, um, great. So let's, uh, another question that we had uh, in advance of the program was about metrics and about measuring success. Um, I think that's something that uh, as somebody who has worked in traditional media and social media, um, metrics are a huge part of our business and uh, always has been in the traditional media world. We talk about impressions and we talk about, um, you know, what's the sort of, uh, ad by equivalent. So if we get a story placed in the news, what's the cost that, that would be affiliated with that if you were to buy an ad side by side with our piece of earned media? So in social, it's a little different though. Um, there is really, I mean, yes, there is paid media in social media, but in the sense, everything is earned. So um, London, want to kick this one to you first. Um, what are some key metrics that you follow when it comes to uh, your, your social posts and tracking the success of that? Sure. Um, I mean, I think that everybody kind of gravitates towards impressions. It's the first thing that all the platforms really push on you and they seem really impressive. It's like, ooh, 10,000 people saw my post. But that doesn't really mean anything because it doesn't really mean that they retained that information. They didn't necessarily click on it. It's literally just you happen to be in their feed as they were scrolling by. So if you really want to impress someone that doesn't know anything about social media, tell them your impressions. Um, but if you want to get a little deeper into it, I mean, I think engagement is a really good metric to look at. Most of the platforms break it down for you so you can see how many likes, how many shares, how many three second video views, 10 second video views. Um, so just the, the things that you can really put a little bit more weight behind are good. And I think the, the end all and be all is you kind of have to set your own goals and find the metrics that match with those. So if your goal is sales, you, you want people to click on your post and click through to your website. So that's all well and good if people are seeing your post, but if you can't track whether or not they're coming to your website and making that sale, then you know it's, the metric doesn't really matter. Or if it's getting people to sign up for your email list, that's a different kind of conversion point, which I think we're gonna talk about a little bit later. But I think starting with, what are your goals? What do you want people to do? And kind of working backwards from there and seeing which analytics kind of feed into that. Sure, that's a really great point. Um, and what I would also say within that construct is uh, the kind of scale concept. So, uh, you know, if you've got 100 followers and you've got an engagement rate of 10%, you've got 10 people out of your 100 following or, you know, uh, engaging with, liking, commenting on your posts, that's really great. If you've got a thousand followers and you've got 10 people liking, commenting, engaging with your posts, that's going to be a lot less, you know, desirable. And for us, especially when we're trying to gauge, um, particularly as we're looking at, you know, in this new world of influencers and, um, you know, trying to kind of read through, uh, you know, what people put out there, what people kind of put as their perceived following, you know, I am influencer X and I've got 60,000 followers and you can take one look at their page and if they've got 60,000 followers and they're only getting 20, 30, 40 likes on a post, you can bet that that's not real engagement. That's not real followers. That's somebody who's paid for their followers. So that's somebody who has, um, you know, maybe gotten them, but, but isn't really, you know, engaging with them, isn't really putting out content that is bringing that audience in and, you know, moving them somewhere. So ultimately for us, not only, you know, numbers, but then sort of the scale and the percentages of your total following are really important to follow. Um, so 
I was going to pose this to Nancy, but I think we're starting to kind of move along. We got to move along into another section here because we said we were going to talk about messaging um, and content. So um, quickly, uh, well, I'm going to pose this one to Nancy uh, and ask, what kinds of content are you seeing working right now um, for your clients or just for stuff that you're consuming? Uh, is it pictures, video? Is it Facebook Live, um, Instagram Live? What do you really think is working right now? Well, the content that I think that is really working right now on social media is video, video content, short content, um, instructional content. You know, any content that's offering people information and in a helpful way that they can access quickly. So I, th I think those are the kinds of things that, that are happening. Um, you're seeing a lot of live video and live video on, on social media. So whether it's you know, a town hall meeting or a, a state press, press announcement, something like that. So we're seeing a lot with live content and a lot of video content. Great. Uh, London, anything that you're seeing in particular besides that? Yeah, I mean, I think the rules have completely gone out the window at this point. And like a month ago, two months ago, I'd have, I would have told you to never, ever post a big, long paragraph on Facebook. But it's as long as you're providing helpful information, it's going to do well at this point. Like for my clients, I have general managers that are writing letters to their customers and I'm posting a picture of that letter and it's getting hundreds of likes and shares and things and that never would have performed well a month ago. But like what people need is very different from what Facebook and Instagram previously were encouraging you to do. So I think as long as you are doing your due diligence in getting the proper information out to people, you can be a little flexible in how you are putting it out there. Like if you're not comfortable doing a live video and you just want to put it out there in a big text chunk, it might not do as well, but it's going to do better than it would have sure. before coronavirus. So that's been really interesting for me to witness. And I think that it just kind of, again, social media can be accessible to anyone, even if you don't have all the tools to do everything that everyone else is doing, just kind of doing what feels right and what your customers find helpful is the most important thing. Absolutely. Uh, quick follow up on that one, London, in terms of, um, you know, kind of about that uh, messaging concept. Uh, how do you avoid sounding tone deaf? Um, I think that is something that has been a real challenge, particularly for those who are in the retail sector or those who have had their entire physical space, you know, shuttered. Um, how do you avoid, you know, how do you get customers continue to engage with them without the like, come on down to my store that you can't walk into or that you have to wear a mask if you walk into. How do you avoid sounding tone deaf? How do you, how do you, how do you get that real genuine, you know, marketing pitch without being too incredibly salesy in this sort of time of crisis? Sure. I mean, I think you just have to be honest and human. And that's what I have found. Like I, I it's weird because a lot of us have spent years cultivating these voices for our brands and our companies. But at the end of the day, we're all just people behind the screen. And I think everyone out in the world that doesn't do social media is finally realizing that. And so if you can just show that you're human and show that you're being earnest and honest and just trying to do the best that you can, because that's all we're doing, your customers are really going to respect that. And I, I think that goes along with just being having common sense and thinking about what you would like to see, what your friends would like to see. And it's not like a really hard sales push. It's more of a, hey, we're a small business and we're struggling and here are the ways that you can support us instead of, hey, buy my product or service, yeah. if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, I think that you, you, you hit the nail on the head there. And there's a couple of, you know, things that I've heard recently. Um, I think that your piece about being humanistic um, and transparent is important because uh, you need to, you know, definitely acknowledge, you know, if indeed you are, you know, maybe feeling a little vulnerable, acknowledging that, you know, you may have some struggles that you're going through now, but that you're a small business, that you're working hard, that you want to either protect your employees, protect your customers, um, and additionally, another really great piece that I heard someone say recently was um, asking yourself, are you serving yourself or are you serving the greater good? And I think that is a really great question to ask for any small business owner before you post, say, is this post serving me or is this post serving the community? And if you can, if you can glean 
mostly towards that second side, that serving the community side, um, you're going to find that your posts are way more well received. So um, let's go quickly and uh, move right along to finding ideas on what to post. And uh, Nancy, want to ask you, uh, you know, do you tell your clients anything specific when they ask you, well, I don't know what to post. Um, any thoughts around, you know, how do you find ideas on what to post? Well, I think thinking about what your audience needs and what's most helpful to them, I think is the first go-to for many of us and for many of our organizations, whether we're schools or nonprofits or small businesses, what do, what do people need and how can I help? So, so I think posting that kind of information, helpful resources um, with a lot of the schools that I've been speaking with, they've been posting, um, you know, follow, follow Friday or, you know, thankful Thursday, different things that have happened in the past year for their school or maybe a year ago that really is, uh, represents something joyful to that community is, is helpful because, you know, blending that kind of information in about your community and what you do and also providing helpful resources is very important. We've been posting a lot of, like with these, the webinars and instructional materials. And I think people are happy to get that information. And, you know, I think always asking your followers on social media, how can you help? What is it that they need? What are they looking for? And people are very generous in response because their needs are are varied at this time and they, they can let you know. Yeah, Juan, anything you wanna to add to that? I would just say that you don't have to reinvent the wheel on social media. People are already doing it really well. So if you just go and look at brands that you love and respect and you know might be similar to you, whether they're competitors or just similar organizations or businesses and kind of seeing what they're putting out there, that's a really great place to start as well if you're kind of strapped for ideas. Lovely. Um, okay. Uh, Want to again, kind of diving a little bit further into this messaging concept. Um, and I guess I'll start with London on this one. What are some important messages that audiences want to hear right now? Um, and ultimately, have you seen anything that's particularly good at, um, at you know engaging with audiences right now? I mean, I think that at this point, everybody knows we're all stressed. We're all going through a hard time. Like you don't have to keep relaying that to your audience like they got it. Um, but what you should be sharing is any changes that are happening, whether it's your hours, whether it's how to access a service or whether you have a new product and just doing that over and over and over again, because you know if you posted on Monday that you were a grocery store and you're changing so that Friday seniors can shop that first hour, you should be posting that over and over again because as soon as people see your post, it's gone, it's lost, they're seeing a bunch of other things. So just kind of any changes that are happening, I think are the most important thing. And that's why people are coming to your page to find that information. That's great. Uh, Nancy, uh, same question. Uh, important messages that audiences want to hear right now. Um, I think it's different partnerships too that you have. Uh, you know, if you are a business, a small business in a certain township, you might be sharing messages that are within your local community that your followers might want to know. So I think anything like that, that will support your followers and support uh, the people that are following your social media is, is anything that's going to help. Great. Um, so again, continuing down this uh, you know, path of content and messaging, um, one of the things that we talk a lot about with our clients is a call to action or a goal conversion. Um, it, goal conversion is sort of you know, modern speak, but it's how do you make that sale? Um, and so London, want to ask you, um, what is a call to action? And um, then sort of, well, let's just start there. What is a call to action? And how do you use it effectively in a social post? Sure. I mean, I think, like I said, you kind of have to go start from scratch and say, well, what are my goals? Have they changed now that my business isn't open or it's virtual or whatever it is? So maybe it's not come to my event, it's sign up for this webinar or, you know, don't call me because I'm not there in the office, but you can DM me on Facebook. So whatever that goal is that you're looking for your audience to reach is something that you should be putting in every single post that you're doing. And that might seem like overkill, 
but it doesn't have to be at the forefront, but you know what I mean? Like if you have an internal help desk that people need to reach, you should put that number in every single post that you do. Yeah. Precisely. I, I think that's so important. And I always try to impart upon clients to find the path of least resistance. And right now that is so important. It's, you know, because if you're, if your retail business was decimated, like you still have a way to serve customers either by phone, by email, by DM on Facebook, by DM on Instagram. Um, if there's a way that you can still continue to serve your customers, find it and find whatever the easiest path is to get them to you. And if you can do that, and if you can find an effective message, again, coming back to, you know, a, a sort of personal plea, a, you know, we care. And this is why, you know, we are your local business and we are different from Amazon and from Target and from Walmart. Like we really do care about you as a customer and this is how we can serve you. And if you can put that in a concise way and give people that like really easy hump to get over, to get into your story, get into your, you know, system, whatever it is, that's a win. And you always want to be driving towards that. So um, we've got a couple more minutes of, uh, of questions, and then I do see some other ones that we've had from, from folks. I do want to also encourage you, if there is anything you have not heard yet, please do post a question in the chat. Uh, we are going to definitely have a few minutes to get through uh, a few more questions at the end of this. So uh, Linda, I'm talking to you. I see your question, and I, we will get to that one. Um, so uh, quickly, customer service. Um, so London, uh, why has social media become such an important avenue for customer service? I heard you kind of uh, say this a little bit earlier about the real people, the humanness. And uh, let's talk a little bit more, more about that. Why is it such an important avenue for customer service right now? I mean, I feel like people basically just turn to social media for customer service before they even are willing to pick up the phone or send an email because they know it's much more instantaneous. They know that someone is supposed to be always watching social media pages. So they think that that's a more direct access point and they're not wrong. I mean, it's a little frustrating for people like me that are dealing with angry customers, <laughs> but it's, you know, I have to remind myself constantly, they're not mad at me personally. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it opens up a lot of opportunity because I would say nine times out of 10, people just want to be heard. And as soon as you answer them, they're so grateful that you even care. They're so grateful for any information you can provide. And it's creating a really amazing platform for brand loyalty, for relationship building. And, you know, for, I'll give you the example of Reading Terminal Market, a lot of people view it as a tourist trap. And that is not the case at all. We are a grocery destination. And that's all they are right now is serving Philadelphia groceries. And now that people are experiencing it in that way, instead of just, oh, this is where I'm going to bring my friends while they're in town. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how we can, we've captured that new audience now that have come to us and had customer service issues and we've helped them. And that is a whole new customer base that we have after all this is over that we can develop. And it's, it's a really great opportunity, I think. I, I would say, yeah, echo that and say that, you know, it's even more of an opportunity because of the nature of a small business, you know, an Acme, uh, you know, a giant, a whatever, you know, an Aldi isn't going to have the same kind of local presence, the same kind of local customer service team that's going to really deliver that, you know, hand held, you know, personal touch value that a small business like, you know, the Reading Terminal might be able to, or the, the merchants inside of that. So um, really great point there, London. Uh, Nancy, want to ask you, uh, do you have any tips for small business owners or nonprofits to practically approach customer service? Um, you know, we all know that as London said, um, the sort of expectation in the world there is that somebody is on the other side of that line and is paying attention. Um, but that might not always be the case, especially if you are your, you know, solo, you know, small business owner and you've laid off half your staff and you got nobody who can help there. Any tips that you can say to practically handle that, that social media inbound customer service inquiry? I say um, communication is, is key to be consistent, consistently checking messages and responding because it, it's calming and it's helpful to people when they get the information that they need. And if they're asking a question, 
you might guess that 10 or 15 other people have that very same question. So uh, for some of the schools that I'm working with, for example, you know, um, they are answering questions about student technology, teacher technology, the parents want information and need information. So if you have one question that's coming in, you then can turn around and create a how-to or create a post that gives that information to everyone because that then that way you're you're really being there for people. And I just think really checking, making sure you have a consistent way to check inbound messages. So no matter the platform, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, that you go in consistently, they're in a different section, you know, and you just read through those so that you're able to answer. Um, or if it's in a public forum, be the one that responds. If someone comments under your post and Facebook, for example, or Instagram that they're unhappy or they have more questions, just make sure that you're responding in a quick manner so that they feel supported. Of course, um, and I would say that, you know, to follow up on that quickly, Nancy, um, like you had said, if one person's asking, there's a chance that 10 to 15 other people are wondering that same question and just haven't, you know, didn't have the gumption to, to reach out and ask. Um, so, you know, if you're getting that level, if you're getting a, a number of questions that are coming through and they all seem to kind of have a similar bent or a similar theme, um, that's an instance where then maybe you might think about creating an FAQ document, a frequently asked questions document, something that then you can post to your website, that you can post to your Facebook page and say, hey, We've heard a lot of questions from you, the customer, you, the, the parent, you, the whatever, student. And we took the time to answer those questions. Please refer to our FAQ document. Um, London, I want to ask you really quickly because I've seen some of this stuff as well. Um, you've used some auto-reply uh, functions on Facebook. Can you speak a little bit about that? Sure. So for Facebook and Instagram, there is a tool where you can set an auto-reply to any messages that you have coming in. Um, it's, it's helpful. I think some customers might find it a little frustrating, but the way that I have set it up is with the critical information that people might be looking for that, you know, I've seen 80% of in inbound messages seeking hours, a contact phone number, and a link to your website. So if you just script something that says, here is our basic information you might be looking for, and then always add the caveat. But if this isn't helping you, someone will be with you. Just let them know if you're going to set up an automated reply that you, you're still seeing it. It's not like you're just, this is your answering machine and you're never going to get back to them. So I would say that's, it's a really helpful tool to just kind of manage what's coming in if you're overwhelmed and still let people know that you will get to them at a certain point. Um, and you know, you can change it as things change. It's, I really like it. It's worth exploring yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, so London, additionally, kind of in the same uh, vein, do you have any tips for handling negative customer, inbound customer service inquiries, um, angry customers? Uh, you know, I, I, we've all dealt with them. Um, do you have any particular tips and how to? I mean, like I said, it's nine times out of 10 people just want to be heard. And I respect that. I, I feel that as a customer. Um, but I, <laughs> It's interesting because I hope that more businesses are understanding this, but I feel like before coronavirus, people were very quick to just block, delete, oh, that's a negative comment, we're just going to erase it entirely. I would never recommend that unless someone is violating Facebook's terms. If they're cursing at you, if they are using any kind of derogatory language, like block that person, they are just no good. Um, but it, if you walked up to someone, if you walked up to like buy a movie theater ticket, and you asked a question, the person just turned and walked away. That would be a horrible interaction. And that's what's happening when you just delete a comment or ignore a message. Um, so it's just, again, building that brand loyalty and just being a human being and saying you're sorry if you messed something up or just trying to connect that person with whatever resources they need. It's just going to provide so much long-term value, even if the short term is you being a little frustrated or sad or whatever it might be that someone is yelling at you through a computer. Um, but you just kind of have to think of the big picture. And again, remember, they're not actually mad at you personally, just their experience. There we go. 
a great one. Uh, Nancy, anything to add to that in terms of dealing with negative inbound customer service? Um, I, th I think I'll notice often in groups that are successful, they'll share their goals and their objectives, you know, so that it kind of keeps people like, okay, this is what we're here about. Um, when there are a lot of um, overly negative messages, sometimes it's just those people are lacking certain information. You know, oh, why, why are, why are my never able to get through to a certain company? You know, and sometimes it's they just need more information. Yeah. So providing what what people are looking for, I, I think is really helpful. But you know, there are times when things are overly negative and and I think it's important to just stay on top of it um, you can message people and say hey how can I help you yeah. but you know there are times where someone's participating in a group and you know there's a lot of either dangerous or negative things that are being shared then um, they they don't have to stay in the group but, I'm yeah. I'm <laughs> if you um, have no, to I, I, I love that. I think that's, um, you know, that's a really great piece to, to think about in terms of, um, you know, particularly in the public space. So you're a manager, may, maybe of a Facebook group or of a page, and you post something and you start getting some really negative comments. Um, as London had said, you know, sometimes just the delete comment and, you know, like, and just, you know, fire that off might make that person more angry and might make them more likely to come back and comment negatively on another post or go to another platform and start commenting negatively there. Um, so that sort of taking that opportunity to nip it in the bud and, you know, if it is really just a, you know, like when it said, sometimes they just want to be, they just want a friendly face to reach out to them and say, hey, we hear you. Yeah. Um, and honestly, that's going to do so much more. So if that is the case, that might be an instance where you take the time to send them a private message, to send them a, a direct message on that platform or on another platform, wherever. If you can find that person and you can make a personal salvo to them, you're going to have a better chance that they might, you know, might turn that negative experience into a positive experience. So um, quickly, uh, we have a few more minutes and I have a couple of questions here. Um, I do want to discuss a couple of pitfalls um, that we have seen lately and one of the kind of biggest, um, and this is similarly in the uh, group uh, uh, theme, uh, we've seen some pitfalls of businesses getting, jumping into groups, uh, public groups and effectively spamming. And so um, it's something that I just want to end up just saying a quick note about here. Um, if you're part of it, if you're a business and you're trying to get out into, you know, say whatever kind of Facebook group it might be, a um, couple of examples, like I said, we have this open and Delco group. Um, there are lots and lots of other community groups like the uh, media has one. Uh, all the neighborhoods in Philadelphia have their own Facebook group like West Willie and South Silly and Fishtown is old, new, awesome, great. Um, but the point is that you want to be authentic. And you don't want to get in there with a, you know, flat out, like just a tone deaf sales pitch. If you're going to go and make that kind of, you know, salvo to a public group, make it authentic and make it from the heart, make it a, a, a real person making a real plea and not just faceless business, come buy my products. But, you know, why, do, why should people care? Is it made locally? Do you support local people? Do you tie it to a charity? Um, there are any number of ways that you can make that post feel more honest without being spammy. Um, additionally, we talked a little bit about oversharing um, and, you know, what's good to post, what's good not to post. Um, that concept of oversharing non-essential messages is another one. Like, again, if you're open every day, great. Um, but if, you know, you might not want to do that same exact flavor of post every single day. If you have, like London said, a senior shopping hour on you know, Thursday at 8 a.m., you might wanna post a couple of times leading up to that. Again, that is a piece of like very good essential information versus just we're open. There might be some specific caveats so that if somebody shows up, they're getting what they expect and they're not, you know, you don't have somebody showing up at 8 a.m. who's not a senior citizen and then you're in a weird situation where you're like, can I let this person into my store? I don't know. So anyway, um, had a couple of other questions here I want to get to. Um, this was an interesting one <clears throat> uh, from a uh, attendee representing a performing arts nonprofit uh, who had all their concerts canceled. Um, no surprise there. Uh, I can uh, personally feel you on that one. Uh, I play in a band and um, had all of our shows canceled. Um, so we're not really sure what's going to happen there. So, um, but 
looking at doing videos online, but need to think about a fee, need to think about an admission. And my thought on that, and I'll take this one first, because again, I, I kind of live in this world, is if you're going to make that jump to attempting a paid live stream, something where somebody has to pay, get a link that then they can watch you, do it for free first. You know, set the expectation or at least gauge whether or not there's an audience there. And if there's an audience there, then you can maybe think about making that jump. And frankly, if you do have an audience there, if you do put it out for free, put a donation link. Put a donation link everywhere you can. Put it on the, you know, do it on Facebook Live. Put it in there. Put it on a banner and put it behind you on the wall so that everybody who's watching this thing knows where they can find you, how they can make a donation. And those two things, I guarantee you, if, you know, it's not going to be, it's not going to equal out to what you were doing in a physical retail sales perspective, but you are guaranteed you're going to find people who are going to engage with you. You're going to find people who are going to donate and potentially you might build a following where you could grow to this. I've seen very few people who have, um, you know, on a, on a small scale, like on a nonprofit or on like a local uh, performing arts organization who have been able to truly and successfully monetize a paid, you know, live stream. But to say that, you know, lots, lots and lots are finding success in this platform from a viewership perspective, absolutely. So I say start small, grow your way up there. Um, Lennon and Nancy, anything to add that you want to add to that? Um, no, no, I think that that, I think that's really, I think putting free content out is very, very helpful to people. And um, yes, definitely sharing your information so that as time goes by, they can reach out to you in, in other ways. Yep. Um, so we had another one about uh, doing different platforms is better. Heard about Snapchat and TikTok. We spoke a little bit about that. Um, Lennon, I don't know if you want to expound just a little bit on those particular platforms again, just to make sure that we can kind of cover that base there. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it really boils down to understanding your audience because if you have, I mean, that I'm obsessed with TikTok, but I'm not gonna use it for any of my brands because it's not, I don't have the time and resources to dedicate to making really creative videos for a brand right now. And if I got on it and was just doing mediocre stuff, it wouldn't help my business at all. So I think that use it again, use it as you and see if it really is something that you can tackle and something that you think your audience would be interested in. You could use another social platform to ask your audience, Hey, if we got a TikTok, would you follow us? Are you on TikTok? Are you on Snapchat? I mean, I don't, I see brands using it strictly for advertising purposes. So I don't know that you're going to find a lot of short-term success there. It's really just, it's not something I would recommend personally at this point. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and um, saw a couple of other ones here. How do I set up and see metrics? How do I see inbound messages right away? So two ways there, uh, well, two questions there. How to see metrics. Um, each platform has really great built-in analytics that you can just find. So if you're on your Facebook page, um, on your actual page, you should look, there's a little strip across the top that has a bunch of things, inbox um, settings, and you're gonna see a tab in there called Insights, or it's under the Creator Studio sometimes now, but for Facebook, it's called Insights. For Instagram, it's also called Insights. And then on Twitter, they have a separate tab in your settings called Analytics. And again, each of these platforms makes it really, really easy to just a snapshot. Now, if you're like us, if you're like me, you dive in on all the like individual data points and find out where people are going and what they're doing and you know what's the sort of trends happening you can get all that but look at just the first level start at the surface level look at what is your growth metrics what's your overall growth metric what's your overall engagement metrics and if you can look at those couple of pieces you're going to get some you know really good thoughts about what's working and what's not working um seeing inbound messages right away i just would only say that if you have a Android or an iPhone, um, something that's running an app, setting up your notifications because you'll get a notification then when somebody is pinging you. Um, that's the best way for an inbound messages. Um, last question, because we're right out of time, really quick. Best way to grow organically done by posting multiple times per day. And what I would say to that is no. Um, I wouldn't say that it's the best way to grow organically. If you're gonna, if you need to spend that much time to grow organically, 
it's not, your time isn't gonna be best spent only posting. So I'll give you an example, uh, say like an Instagram. Uh, you have, you know, I've got Alex's business page, whatever you wanna call it, Alex's landscaping services page. Um, I'm not, and I'm trying to grow a following. I am definitely not gonna grow a following by posting three times a day on my Instagram feed. I'm gonna spend a lot of time creating that content. I'm gonna spend a lot of time getting those pictures and I'm not gonna get a lot of results out of that. If I'm posting once a day, great, fine. Uh, but if I need to spend that extra time, what I would do is I would use my page and I would go out and I would look at other content. I would go into hashtags, I would go to locations. I might start liking, commenting or further interacting with other pages or other people. So in that case, it can feel spammy at times, but if you find a way to, to do it in an honest way and in an organic way, somebody who's actually looking for the services or there's a post that is super relevant, like somebody, you know, like I said, coming back to this landscaping and I'm just spitballing here, but um, somebody posted like, you know, they post a picture of their yard and it's all dead and disgusting and they tag their location as Delaware County. I can be in that Delaware County thing and I see a picture of a yard that looks crappy and no other landscaping company has commented on that post. Maybe that's an opportunity for me to jump in there. And that may be one person, one follower, but if one follower equals one sale equals one customer, that's a win. And that's organic. That is as organic as it goes. So anyway, um, that's about all the time we have guys. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Um, really, really excited that we had so many people join. Um, and honestly, if you have any other questions, uh, you can certainly follow up uh, via, you can find Bellevue Communication on the web, bellevuepr.com. All of us are listed. Uh, Nancy, you can find on e2today.com. Um, and yeah, we would love to uh, further answer anybody's questions um, personally or whatever. So please feel free to reach out if you need to. Oh, and I guess Dan, Danny's going to talk about the next program. Oh, thanks so much, everybody. So just one quick reminder for Tuesday um, at 10 a.m., we'll be doing the webinar on identifying signs of abuse amid social distancing. We're really focusing this, particularly um, looking at issues uh, for our children uh, that are doing the uh, you know, social distancing and are schooling from home. Um, and uh, we would welcome folks to have the opportunity to come to that, as well as our updating. Uh, we have some resume workshops uh, some so and additional social media coming up in the next few weeks. So we look forward to seeing you and make sure to check in at www.nucenter4leadership.com or open in Delco for our programs. Uh, thanks so much today, Alex, Nancy, and London for a fantastic program. Everyone have a great day and uh, be safe and well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, puppies. <laughs> and there and my dogs say thank you too. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>